Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. The Mountain Meadows Massacre is without the question the lowest point in Mormon history. In it, a bunch of Arkansas settlers were all killed by Mormons. It's really a terrible atrocity. In our conversation with Barbara Jones Brown, we'll learn more about this massacre. What were some of the events that led up to it? How much federal response led to the tensions in the Utah Territory? Barbara will answer those questions. Check out our conversation. If you haven't had a chance to check out our last episode with Dr. Matt Harris, it's a hidden episode only available to newsletter subscribers. To subscribe for free, just go to gospeltangents.com newsletter, and I'll send you a link for that hidden episode. It's a fascinating conversation and conclusion to uh, President Benson's life. So check that out. Now back to our conversation. Well, welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have a wonderful historian. Could you go ahead and introduce yourself? I'm Barbara Jones Brown, and I'm really excited to be with you here today, Rick. All right. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about your background? Uh, I'm assuming you have a background in history. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, I have a master's degree in American history from the University of Utah. Okay, go Utes. <laughs> but my undergraduate degree was at BYU. Oh, no, in... you're, 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 you're conflicted. <laughs> a little bit. My husband went to the University of Utah as well. And okay. And um, three of our sons. Now, the, the most important question is, who do you root for when they play? <laughs> when they play each other, I root for BYU. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> but if they're not playing, I root for University of Utah, which my brothers who went to BYU tell me I, I shouldn't be doing, even yeah. if they're not playing. <laughs> Yeah, so I could just call me purple since I have degrees. From purple. Both. See, I went to Weber State, so I am truly purple. You're, you're truly purple. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so awesome. So um, I know that you were uh, recently, let's see, what's the word, called or something like that to be hired, ch- hired uh-huh. in charge of the Mormon History Association. Tell us about that. That's right. In May, I became executive director of the Mormon History Association, which is an independent scholarly organization established in 1965 by Leonard Arrington. Mm-hmm. So I consider it a great honor to be heading that organization. And I work with an all-volunteer board of really fantastic historians and mm-hmm great people who come, um, professional historians, academic historians, history enthusiasts, all kinds of people come to MHA, as as Mm -hmm. you do too, Rick, Uh, so you know how great it is, so I'm really excited to be heading up this organization. Well, and I I go to a lot of Mormon history conferences, and I always tell everybody that Mormon History Association is the best conference, without question, so... so it's fantastic. Yeah, so I, I feel the same. I love it. Yeah, you, you'll get the best scholars at Mormon history uh, anywhere. So, yeah. well, great. So that just started in May, and right. uh, where's the next meeting, by the way? Uh, thank you for asking. Next year, it's in Salt Lake City. Oh, so it's close. It, it's it's in northern Utah. If you live in northern Utah, it'll be close, and so a great opportunity to come. Um, we go to a different city every year, and so this year we'll be in Salt Lake City. Um, it marks the sesquicentennial of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad uh, in northern Utah. Mm-hmm. And so to commemorate that event and the context in which it occurred, we're going to be holding it in Salt Lake City. So you're not having it in the, the Golden Spike Place, isn't it? No, in we, we, looked at, we looked at Ogden as a possibility mm-hmm. because it's closer to Golden Spike, uh, but the facilities were just more... In, in, Salt Lake. In, in Salt Lake City. Okay. Well, I'm so, excited. It's, it's, yeah, it's going to be a great I'm always experience. conflicted because when it's far away, like my first one I went to was in Independence. Yeah. And so I don't, so it's awesome because I'm there all day and I don't have anything at home. But when yeah. it's at home, then I always feel like I have to go back and forth and yeah, it's I don't get to go to as think, much. Oh, I should do a little work while I'm still here. Exactly. Go to family things while I'm still here. But yeah, try and just block it off and consider it a a break and come up and spend as much time as you can. All right. And Paul Reeves, the new president for the next year. Paul Reeves, a a professor of history at University of Utah, is our president this year. Yeah. Um, And so working closely with him and our local arrangements committee and our program committee to put together a great program. We Mm -hmm. have some great pre and post conference tours. Oh, yeah. As well. I've never done those. Those are too expensive. (laughs) <laughs> well, we're trying to keep them as affordable as possible, just covering the costs, uh, basically. But we're, we'll try and keep them as affordable as we can, and they should be really great. So. Yeah, yeah, they're always 
great. I, I always hear wonderful things about them, but I've, yes. I've never done that yet. So This will be the year. <laughs> Where will it be the following year? Um, we have not signed any contracts yet, but we are looking at Rochester, New York. Oh, wow. As a possibility. Oh, wow. So as soon as it, uh, a contract is nailed down with that, assuming we can get something to work, then we will announce that one. So. And do we, do we know who the president is? Uh, like the president-elect who will be president in 2020 is Ignacio Garcia, I don't know him. who is a professor of history at Brigham Young University. Okay. So. Well, fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, the reason why uh, I wanted to talk to you was um, you actually gave the lunchtime session uh, in June uh, about the, more, the Mountain Meadows Massacre, and so I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, but uh, let's, let's back up a little bit. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, the Mountain Meadows Massacre with Steve Mayfield. We talked a little bit about the deadly, the deadly scroll, yeah. and uh, but he he wasn't really good on the history. So let's let's talk a little bit about the history. What what was the environment like uh, in 1857 that caused this uh, horrible tragedy in in 1857? Well, in early 1857, you have um, a new president, James Buchanan, take office. And shortly after he takes office, he begins hearing reports from federal appointees who were coming from Utah Territory and saying that uh, Utah was not safe for quote unquote Gentiles, um, what was what were called non Mormons were called at the time, saying that there was a theocracy, a growing theocracy in the West, that Brigham Young, who was both president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints, and governor of the territory of Utah held too much power um, and just saying that that this was a threat to American ideals of democracy and that that they might even possibly want to secede and, and so those rumors those stories along with a memorial a memorial is uh, like a petition so a memorial from Utah's legislature saying look, if you keep sending us federal officials that we don't like, that we don't agree with, we're going to send them away. Um, and please choose appointees that are from among us and represent our values. And if not, basically one, one legislator said uh, it was practically a declaration of independence. So there's these kind of stories, these kind of rumors, you know, some based in fact, some exaggerated that reach Washington and so the new president concludes that he needs to send a whole new set of territorial appointees to Utah including one to replace Brigham Young as governor and that he's going to send um, federal troops with them to ensure that they are uh, placed um, successfully and with no resistance from local Utahns. So Brigham Young and church leaders interpret this as a threat, and they vow that the army, the troops, will never enter into their settlements. So you have, I'm, I'm really glossing over things quickly here, but you have what came to be called the Utah War Erupt, where the troops and the federal appointees, as they are nearing settlements of what was then Utah Territory, um, Young and other church leaders send out Mormon militiamen to hamper their way. So they're running off their cattle, they're burning the grass in front of them, um, they are burning their supply wagons, doing everything they can to try and get the troops to be stopped on the plains that year. So that's the environment you've got. You've got this war hysteria going on, if you will, in Utah Territory. Um, and you also have Young and other leaders devising strategies to try and keep Buchanan from, he's afraid that um, if he's replaced as governor and as Indian superintendent of Utah, that the intention might be to drive the saints again from their homes in Utah. Um, so he starts kind of bluffing, if you will, to Washington and saying, look, if you remove me, if you take the Mormons, out of our place here, then we are no longer going to um, control the Indians. He starts playing on 19th century white stereotypes of Native Americans and saying, if you remove the Mormons, me and the Mormons from our place here, we aren't going to control the Indians 
and they, uh, emigrants, will no longer be able to pass through Utah Territory on their way to California and Oregon Territories, where the resources are rich, and the United States needs those resources on the West Coast. So he says, I'll be, you know, we won't be here to make immigration safe anymore. So he um, starts bluffing, as I was saying, saying that the Indians are going to start immigration, attacking immigration trains, and it's your fault because you're sending the army and you're going to displace me. So privately, Young's interpreters are encouraging Indians to raid emigrant cattle trains going through so that it plays into this strategy of trying to convince the federal government to leave the Mormons alone where they are. So, so is it really a bluff then if he's, if he's telling the Indians? I mean, is he telling the Indians it's okay to attack these emigrants? I say tanks? it's a bluff because he knew that um, he was using the Indians. He was using that story to say it's all because of me that immigration is safe. Okay. So, yeah, that's a bluff. so let me let me back up just a little bit, I'm trying to see if this is a more modern day equivalent. You know, uh, under President Bill Clinton, what was that twenty years ago? We had the Branch Davidians in Texas, and the, of course the Waco compound. Would that be a similar sort of uh, uh, environment uh, that was happening in eighteen fifty seven, as, as we saw under under President Clinton? Um, you know, I'm not an expert on those events that you mentioned, but there was definitely um, a siege mentality that sets in in Utah that we're going to oppose the federal troops and they're coming to do us no good. And we need to kind of dig in our heels and be ready to burn our settlements. Young is, is preaching uh, if the federal troops come in. So there's definitely that kind of a hysteria. Okay. Going on. I'm just yeah. wondering. Yeah. So it sounds kind of similar. Um, what about uh, you know the I'm trying to read which article of faith that says where we will uh, honor, obey, and sustain the law. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how do how does how does Brigham Young square that article of faith with, hey, we're going to burn the grass and we're we're going to set the Indians loose and and that sort of a thing. Yeah. So it basically what it was was guerrilla warfare. Um, And he repeatedly says he doesn't intend any bloodshed. And if it weren't for the Mountain Meadows Massacre and um, a couple of other troops that died, one one man has a heart attack and and so forth. Um, uh, One man is killed. I won't go, (laughs) there's a lot of tangents in this story, but um, he says he doesn't want anyone to be killed repeatedly. But of course, we have a very bloody conflict, particularly because of the atrocity of the Mountain Men's Massacre, which was a war atrocity that occurs in this context. It seems like Juanita Brooks, in her in her book, she she put, pinned a lot of blame on Brigham Young for creating a a, yeah. a tough atmosphere. Um, yeah, um, and I agree with that interpretation. His rhetoric was very dangerous, I think. So publicly, he was saying some pretty uh, some things to really whip people into a frenzy over this. And again, it's part of that bluff to Washington, but it had this effect of creating a frenzy in Utah. And once um, he realizes how bad it is, he tries to calm people down and say, hey, I, I don't intend anybody to want a fight, you know, and we need to, you know, don't be looking for a fight. But by then, um, you've had the massacre and you've had. It's too late. Damage has has been done. So, yeah, definitely um, his rhetoric. And, you know, with someone with that kind of power to use that kind of strong rhetoric, it's going to have consequences. So if you were, you know, I know we're playing armchair quarterback. (laughs) If you were advising Brigham Young today, what what were some things that you would have wished that he would have done differently? Well... I don't know. Historians don't necessarily ask that question. What, <laughs> what should he have done differently? Um, or what if? You know, we're not supposed to ask those questions, but just say what did happen. But um, yeah, I mean, 161 years later, it's easy to say, well, he shouldn't have used that kind of rhetoric and uh, should have allowed the troops to come in without resistance, I suppose. But again, 
as a historian, you try to understand everyone's mindsets from mm -hmm. all sides and everyone's motives. And so you think, okay, when I say understand, I don't mean necessarily commiserate with, but just come to a comprehension of why they saw things or acted the way they did. And these folks had been driven from Missouri and Illinois just you know, 10, 20 years before. So that was still really fresh in their minds. And so there is that paranoia or that fear of outsiders, that fear of troops, that fear of soldiers that's still with them that I think drives the way that they acted. But yeah, sure, in 2018, it's easy for us to say, oh, well, he should have just been calm and shouldn't have um, resisted mm -hmm. the incoming troops. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Barbara Jones Brown. In our next conversation, we'll talk about the Parley P. Pratt murder. He was a beloved apostle in the LDS Church and, his, and was murdered just a few months before the Mountain Meadows Massacre. How big of a role did that play in the Mountain Meadows Massacre? None of the perpetrators, um, quite a lot of them eventually come out and say why this happened, as well as local people, and they give a whole slew of motives and reasons for why this happened. Not one of them ever said that Parley P. Pratt's murder was a motive. Please subscribe at patreon.com slash gospel tangents. For $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview uncut. So please subscribe at Patreon or on our website at gospeltangents.com as well. For our latest updates, please like our page at facebook.com slash gospel tangents. And also check our Twitter updates at, at Gospel Tangents as well. Please subscribe on our Apple Podcast page at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents, or you can subscribe on your Android device. Uh, just do a search for Gospel Tangents. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again.